today, and I'm delighted especially that you can join us to um, hear the work of Dan Colin, who is um, a doctoral student at York University and who will be presenting uh, to us uh, today about uh, her dissertation work and more broadly about her work in music and disability studies. Uh, and again, I'm really grateful to Ms. Cullen, who frankly has been involved in increasingly in international um, issues in music and disability for quite some time. Uh, and I really appreciate you all being here. I also appreciate you uh, being part of a recording. Um, we are going to be recording this and making it available certainly internally to the university and depending on our speakers preferences also potentially more broadly. Um, if, as we go along, any of you have any questions, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat i'll keep track of them and. Um, Ms. Cullen has uh, has made sure to, to plan her talk so that there'll be time at the end for questions. We'll start with any questions that have arisen in the interim, and then we can open things up. So without too much further ado, thanking you all for being here, I will uh, pass it to Diane Cullen. Thank you very much. I am going to share my screen. Let me know if you can see this. I will also. Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. Thank you. OK. OK, so my name is Diane Collin. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a PhD candidate in musicology at uh, York University in Toronto, in Canada. And I am. Very grateful today to be with you. Thank you so much to Professor Del Antonio for inviting me. Uh, I entit entitled this presentation, A Dive into Music and Disability from Theory to Practice, because this is really what I do. I study frameworks that uh, guide me academically. And in my case, they are all related to uh, disability and music. And then I put them into application in several aspects of my journey in the professional uh, world of musicians with disabilities. It's a dive, but uh, it's also um, a brief overview of only a few cases. And I have colleagues out there doing a great job of uh, inclusion and openness, uh, whether it is in the choirs community, the, the orchestral community, the composers, the musicologists uh, or ethnomusicologists, um, the teachers, the, the performers, including those who I will mention today. Um, I hope that this presentation will make you want to check out the work of musicians and people uh, active in the music industry who work for a better accessibility and integration. So briefly, I will present myself. I'm a voice teacher in a music school in Toronto for children uh, called CMST. I'm also a teacher, uh, a teacher assistant at York University in the music department. I am a singer and I'm uh, happy to be able to sing in many different styles from the jazz training I originally received to, uh, to classical music, to, to French chanson and to other languages and cultures because I just, love to discover new ways of singing as much as I explore uh, new ways of performing with a disability. Uh, I'm also a researcher, I'm a musicologist. Uh, I started in France, where I orig originally come from, uh, with the study of Ludwig van Beethoven, which was my first exploration uh, of the topic of disability in music. And today I work with a, a lot of different musicians with disability, uh, and all these uh, interviews and collaborations, uh, they really enrich me and teach me new concepts that uh, can only improve everything I try to accomplish here. And this picture you can see on the screen uh, was taken a few months ago at a, a grad student symposium at York University. I was performing with the trio, the jazz trio of uh, Kisha Belkovacs, who is sitting at the piano. Uh, she's hidden behind the piano over there. Uh, and this is these are musicians of the, her trio around me. And as you can see, I'm a wheelchair user. So, ah, here. 
Uh, so we, we will uh, be together for a bit less than hour than one hour, uh, more 50 minutes than one hour. Um, so this is what I want to discuss during the, our time together. As I mentioned, I will uh, tell you about uh, some of the frameworks I use, I'm using in my work for the theoretical aspect. And for the, the practical aspect, uh, I will show you uh, study cases and topics and how I, I put some of that into application. So let's talk about frameworks. And I would like to mention first that uh, the field that really allowed to study uh, more in details, different notions and concepts and perceptions uh, of disability is called the critical disability, critical disability studies or CDS. Uh, so basically a critical lens on disability. And critical means that you're able to synthesize and analyze and evaluate uh, what is going on in a specific field or topic. And there are many models of disabilities that were defined, are defined in CDS. Uh, so I won't, I won't be able to cover all of them, but one really important model uh, when it comes to arts and to positionality and to activism is called the social model of disability. And the social model, uh, this model comes uh, to opposition to another uh, of these models called the medical model of disability. And there is actually a constant duality between the two because the social model challenges preconceived notions of disability established by the medical model, which analyzes disability from a strictly medical and functional point of view. Uh, so the medical model will uh, give you a pathology it will talk about bodily impairments, so things such as I am paraplegic, I am blind, uh, I have this and that disease. And um, this medical model tends to force people to believe that there is a cure against disability, which sometimes is true, sometimes is not, and sometimes is very complicated. So now to go back to the social model, uh, this one will talk about the way a person is viewed included and perceived in society. And this one shows how uh, it is the society itself that was not fought and built with people with disability in mind that causes the disability. So for example, if the building has stairs and I am in front of this building with my wheelchair, I won't get in and it makes me disabled. It makes me unable to get in. But uh, if you put a ramp, then everybody can get in. Whether you use or not a wheelchair, everybody can get in. But then I'm not disabled anymore. I am able to get in. And this distinction between disability and impairment, uh, this is the, the these people we see on screen. These are the first authors to propose a distinction with a critical lens. And so they were Michael Lever and Colin Barnes. They were part of... Uh, what was called the Union for Physically Impaired Against Segregation, or UPIAS. Uh, it was a disability rights activism movement uh, founded in 1972 in the UK. By the way, the UK, fantastic country for disability, and especially in the arts, they still are very involved in funding arts initiatives uh, for people with disabilities today. So very important country. It started there for the critical uh, point of view. And then the field of CDS evolved to propose other aspects and it's, it's still evolving today. So my first framework is the short social model of disability. And my second framework is another model that takes its roots into the social model. It's called the cultural model. And it appeared in the 1980s and it was based on the idea that people are seen as an oppressed minority group with a particular culture. And from that, several movements were born from this concept, including these two I will mention. Uh, one is called deaf culture and the other one is called crip culture. And I found uh, this, so let me show you this picture, the D deaf community. So you can see here it's sign language. Uh, there is a lowercase d and there is a capital D. Uh, and these lowercase d and capital D deaf culture, I found it very, very interesting. And this is a part of, um, uh, something that is part of the deaf community defining deaf culture, not as a disability, but as a fact. Uh, if you're born deaf, it's a fact. Uh, in the same community, they divide into two groups of deafness, 
uh, one with a lowercase d dev and one with capital D dev, which is tricky, right? The capital D dev people, for example, won't have any cochlear implant. You know that the uh, the device that they that connects the brain to the the ear. Uh, this is something you need to uh, get surgery to get inside. You need to get approved by a hospital. You need to get followed medically. Um, you need to, uh, you don't know if it will work at the end. Uh, so, but it defends the medical model according to this uh, capital D deaf community. It will force a cure and they defend the social model. So for such things such as sign language is a language like any other that should be learned. And I agree, it should be taught in, in, in all schools like any other language. And um, one of the concepts was there are other ways to hear. And there are many pros and cons arguments uh, coming with the idea of separating the and deaf community. But this idea of other ways to hear had a huge impact in my own research, especially related to Beethoven, um, but mostly on the concept of uh, perspe perception because there is this preconceived idea that um, to be deaf means silence and to play music means sound. So the two cannot come together, which is not true. It is related to the way we perceive and assume things. And in the case of deafness, if the singer signs the lyrics with sign language, it is visible, it is different, but it cannot be heard. So is it still perceived as music? So as an example of deaf culture, deep hop was developed by a deaf hip hopper called Wawa. And deep hop is a form of hip hop in which the artist rhythmically signs a song and also sings it uh, with words. And so two languages come to simultaneous, simultaneously and uh, they, it brings deaf or hard of hearing people and hearing musicians closer. So uh, the other, uh, the crip culture now, more about the crip culture, the term triple was used for a long time, but uh, it started uh, to be particularly related to disability in a very negative way in the 1920s. So the term cripple uh, is an outdated and offensive uh, term uh, that was used to define, uh, in starting the 1920s, used to define a disabled person. And in crip culture, the term trip stands for Cripple. The term was reclaimed uh, by the disability rights movements to represent disability pride, uh, borrowing the concept from civil rights movements. And now in the disability community, we also use terms such as crip time. This is a notion, the uh, crip time is used to take the time required by or impairment or condition to complete a task or to rest or to learn in our own rhythm. Another example uh, using the, the term Crip is in this movie, Crip Camp, uh, available on Netflix. So for those who have access to it, you can just type Crip Camp on Netflix, you will find it. The full title is Crip Camp, A Disability Revolution. And uh, it's a 2020 American documentary film uh, directed and written by uh, Nicole Newman and James Lebrecht. And as you can see on the screen, uh, the executive producers were Barack and Michelle Obama because they really believed that the story of Crip Camp and disability activism should be uh, heard and seen. And so the, the story of it, what it's, uh, it's about, it tells the, the story of young artists, young students, young teachers with disabilities uh, who wanted to get together in the 1970s uh, to talk about the problem of disability representation in society. Um, so they first met uh, when they decided to uh, go to this camp called not Crip Camp. This is the nickname, but Camp Jeanette. And it's a summer, it was a summer camp in New York. And this group eventually became the starting point of a fight that will become very important in the United States, the fight for disability rights particularly what we know today as the American Disability Act, ADA. And so this is the whole story of how it was born, uh, born and how it developed. And I highly recommend that you watch this movie. Um, I saw some comments in the chat saying that uh, the documentary in, in a disability advocacy class, that's exactly uh, the place to see it, but also for your own 
uh, culture on, on how it developed. It's really an amazing movie. It has powerful images on how to fight together with a disability with the help of some other groups that were also fighting at this time. Um, so now that we have an overview of frameworks we will use, let's talk about topics and musicians. So in my research, I start with the historical study of disability and music, and then I go to some other topics such as sociological analysis, uh, music education, uh, music practices, and so on. So we will see some of these topics together and the story of uh, some musicians to illustrate these topics. So let's talk about the historical part. For me, the historical part is everything uh, related to disability, music and disability before the 20th century. So there are many, 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 many musicians. Uh, it's not all limited to one, but I will talk about this one that everybody thinks about when we talk about that. This is the guy, Ludwig von Beethoven. So there is a joke uh, when I was still taking uh, courses and classes in York, in York University, um, there was a, a story about me that says that whatever the topic was, I was oh, I always had a, a, a Beethoven story somewhere. So this is my Beethoven story for today. Um, everybody knows he was deaf, right? Well, he was not deaf. He was profoundly deaf. And that makes a difference. He was still, he could still hear a little bit of sounds uh, at the end of his life, but not sounds that he could make sense of. So I won't focus on the fact that he was an excellent composer, that he was uh, able to have a full orchestra in his head for compositions and everything. But what I am interested in is the very imaginative and constant research of finding better tools to communicate with others. And we always have this image of him being lonely and secluded. Well, he was also a very social guy. And he was sad when he was not able to be part of the conversation. But he was at the cafe every day. He was reading newspapers, uh, discussing the news with others. Uh, he was taking his meals over there. So he, people would come to him and talk to him. He was meeting with friends. So here we go. Uh, what he did to adapt to his decreasing hearing is kind of a labyrinth. So you all, for those who study music, you all know this instrument. It's a torture instrument that is called the metronome. <laughs> and that, uh, so the, the, the person who commercialized this metronome was called Melzel, and he was a friend of Beethoven. So when he started to have, um, when he started to have uh, hearing issues and that was decreasing and he was talking to it about his closer, closer friends, uh, Melzel said, well, let me invent something for you. And he came up with this. So these are, air trumpets and these are the ancestor of hearing aids actually these ones are in Bonn uh, where Beethoven was born in Germany and uh, in the Beethoven archives and I was able to try them because there are some uh, similar copies of these and um, so it's very efficient uh, you hold it either you uh, there there is a like a, a head holder and it holds by itself but that doesn't work very well you really have to plug it to your uh, to your ear and ask someone to talk about, uh, to talk here, right? So there are smaller ones and they're a little bit larger and there are these huge ones that you have to hold with two hands, right? And uh, you can imagine Beethoven say, can you talk in the pan over there? So no, it didn't work very well at a certain point. You didn't want to carry that in the bar, right? <laughs> so in the cafe. So um, he used that for a few years, uh, especially inside his home, but uh, his hearing was uh, constantly decreasing. So at a certain point, he could not hear uh, use that anymore. So he used this. This is the size of this little notebook. It's called a conversation book. And he was using that in his pocket with a pen. And everybody uh, knew that if you wanted to talk to him, you had to ask him for his uh, little notebook. Uh, and we have nine years of archives of every conversation that happened between Beethoven and someone else. Uh, not that we have the replies Beethoven gave because he gave that orally, but all these notebooks contain uh, the history of the conversation. So it's an amazing source. He also used that uh, a, shock, a simple shock board uh, when he was at home 
to uh, you know talk with his nephew that was living uh, with him uh, who was living with him or people who were visiting him not everything was on these conversation books but it was a very convenient way to communicate and i'm pretty sure that if computers were developed at this time you would have found an imaginative way of using these computers but that's for the social life what did he do for musical life where he did this this was, so this is a Broadwood piano, which is the last piano he received when he, uh, before he died. He, was, he composed his last piano sonatas on that. It was sent by Broadwood, who was um, a piano factor in London. And he said, okay, let's, uh, I love this piano because uh, as opposed to the Viennese pianos that are not that vibrating, this one, it vibrates a lot. And so if I touch a note, it vibrates in a certain way. And he started saying, okay, can we find a way to redirect the sounds towards me? You know, normally a piano, it has a lid and you open the lid and on the side, you can hear the sound better. So they removed the lid and they built this contraption. It's, it's called a hearing machine. And um, they put it, uh, they removed the lid and placed it uh, on the piano. And it allowed him to perceive some sound, but also to work on this uh, amazing, powerful vibration of the of the the whole frame of the instruments, and um, I was able to uh, test this uh, this this device in 2021, uh, thanks to this um, performer researcher called Tom Begin, who uh, did who rebuilt this uh, uh, this hearing machine and recorded um, recorded CDs on that, and uh, so. I cannot tell you the whole story, but I lived, I lived uh, a living, living, lived experience of hearing the sound and feeling the vibration, and it was, yeah, indeed, so cool. It was really, really good. Okay, I have to move on, but I could talk about it for hours. Let's go to sociology. Sociology, it's the study of social life, right? Social change, uh, the social causes and consequence of uh, human behavior. And to uh, so a lot to do with perception and assumption, uh, and especially on disability here. Uh, so to illustrate that uh, in the context of disability, let me introduce you an amazing Scottish percussionist called Evelyn Glennie. Um, and so her work is to tell her story about uh, listening in another way through her body. And she uh, she is deaf. She is a deaf musician. She was not born deaf, but uh, she became deaf as uh, a child at the age nine after an illness. And uh, uh, she was uh, already very talented for music uh, since early in her life. She has written many books about her experience that uh, led her to think of other ways of listening to music. Um, so, but also to redefine the law of accepting students with disabilities in music school because herself, she was not she was rejected because she was deaf basically and uh so she wanted to change that and she did she changed that and also um how she could access the professional music world and increase education today uh about music and disability that's that's her work it's it's a very interesting work so i interviewed her um about her path to the professional music world and um for, for example, when she uh, fights a lot of assumptions, like there is no way she can play music without hearing or uh, because she, she reads lips very well, uh, people think that she is not really deaf. <laughs> and that's, uh, with, you know, she pretends. No, no, she doesn't pretend. <laughs> I met her, I can tell you. Uh, but she developed a lot of different techniques to be able to communicate and to impact lives of her life and of the life of others. Um, but musically, she plays the percussion, and like Beethoven with her last, with his last piano, uh, a piano is also percussive, right? With the hammers hitting the strings, and uh, making the wood vibrate. Uh, the same with Evelyn Lady's percussions, and she has like four thousand percussion at the second, uh, at the upper floor of her office. It's really impressive. So she did an interesting tech talk to explain her learning process. By the way, that was, that's her today. But uh, this TED Talk was done a few years ago and she explains her learning process and how she worked with her teacher. So let's watch that. I remember when I was 12 years old and I started 
playing timpani and percussion. And my teacher said, well, how are we going to do this? You know, music is about listening. And I said, yes, I agree with that. So what's the problem? And he said, well, how are you going to hear this? How are you going to hear that? And I said, well, how do you hear it? He said, well, I think I hear it through here. And I said, well, I think I do too, but I also hear it through my hands, through my arms, my cheekbones, my scalp, my tummy, my chest, my legs, and so on. And so we began our lessons every single time tuning drums, in particular the kettle drums or timpani, to such a narrow pitch interval. So something like... That of a difference, then gradually and gradually. And it's amazing that when you do open your body up and open your hand up to allow the vibration to come through, that in fact the tiny, tiny difference can be felt with just the tiniest part of your, your finger there. And so what we would do is that I would pop my hands on the wall of the music room and together we would listen to the sounds of the instruments and really try to connect with those sounds far, far more broadly than simply depending on the ear. So despite the assumption that she would not be able to play, she just developed another way of hearing with her teacher. And today she teaches this method to many children with or without disability. And me as a growing up children, I was very interested in everything that she had to teach me, right? So speaking of teaching, it like leads to our next topic, which is education and the importance of teachers, but also team members. And one element that is crucial in the, in the progression of a musician with or without disability is education. So students with disabilities, um, they face multiple issues in school uh, from the simple fact to be admitted in, in the school, uh, uh, to uh, keep going in the scholarity and also to complete the studies, right? So all that, it couldn't happen without the teacher. The role of the teacher is ultra important. So let me introduce you, George Dennehy. Um, like Evelyn Blenny, George Dennehy had a teacher that allowed him to um, be who he is musically today. Uh, he was born uh, without arms in Romania in a family that didn't have the money to raise a disabled child. Uh, by the way, they are still connected today, this family in Romania and himself. So it's not like they abandoned him and never talked about it anymore. They, it's just a certain point, a certain time, it was difficult at this time, so they preferred to put him into adoption. And he was adopted by a, a family in the United States, and they already had children. It was a very musical family, and everybody was playing an instrument. So there was no way he, it would be different for him, right? So he was uh, told, well, you have many, many instruments in the room. Try something. So with some help, he started with the cello, and then today he plays the guitar and he sings. And he's also a motivational speaker. So the same, I interviewed him. And when I interviewed him, he told me how important his teacher was for him, but also how uh, he got help to figure out uh, how to play his instruments differently. So let's watch this little interview. It's really amazing. My Before I ever even had one lesson on cello, my teacher took it upon herself to learn how to play with her feet first. So she just wanted to see, you know, is it possible? Could, could it be done? I mean, could, could, could someone like her even figure it out? And she did, after, after like a week or so, she figured out that, you know, if you put the cello on the floor, on a pillow, and keep it secure, um, and hold the bow with, with one foot, and then, and then the, do the notes with the other foot, uh, she, 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 could, uh, she was able to play uh, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star just with her feet. So then she was able to teach me. And she came up with an idea for the bow because a bow is a little hard to grip uh, just with, with your feet. So what we did was we took a frog, the frog on a bow, and we put it upside down on the top of the bow, uh, kind of where the, the frog sits anyway. It's just like kind of mirrored, but on top. 
so I could put my, my toes and hold the, the frog. And then that's what, that, that way I can, I can use that to, to, to do the bow. And I played the cello on the floor, propped up on a pillow for, for a little bit, but we found quickly that, that, that the cello being on the floor suppresses the sound a lot. Uh, especially if you're on a rug and, or on a blanket, which, which it was. Uh, so there is another guy, a man from our church who was an engineer and he, he built stuff. Uh, one day, uh, his family came over to our house for, for like a cookout or lunch on Sunday or something. And he went over to my cello and made some measurements and just started looking at it and took his ruler and took notes and then they just left. And then he came back uh, two days later with this custom made contraption that was a, a cello stand, basically. And it propped the cello up where I could sit on a big, on a, on a tall stool. And, and the cello was propped up on this stand that was held up by, I'm forgetting the terms, but uh, you know, like violin players and viola players, they have like their chin wrists mm. and the, the thing that their shoulder lays on, um, those rubber things that, that go on the, on the viola. It, there's four of those and the cello sits on those and, and, and kind of lays on those rubber things just like a viola does. Um, and, and I started playing it that way. So George gave me a picture of that, <laughs> and you can see how uh, what he was talking about, like the reversed uh, frog, so that he could uh, grip it with his feet and uh, custom made um, uh, stands and the high stool and everything. So that's how he started to play. But what does it mean all that? It means that when you're a musician with a disability, you need to have a bit of an engineering mind. Or have someone to discuss with with you with you and and to help you figure out uh, what adaptation works for you. So it's a teamwork, right? So we heard both, right? That the, the teacher, uh, the teacher's efforts and the team's efforts uh, to make that happen. So speaking of theory to practice, when I started this journey of exploration, uh, I was only focusing on uh, professional musicians in the professional world. Uh, how they progressed and how they were today uh, uh, performing. But these musicians are interviewed, they all talked about their music education. It was a bit different from those uh, who follow a traditional music school. Uh, so it made me think. And what I do today is that in the music school I'm, t I'm working in, um, I organize adaptive instruments and adaptive voice workshops uh, for children, uh, for the teachers, uh, for everybody who wants to attend, who's connected to this uh, this school, so that they can discover other ways uh, uh, of performing and other ways of reading music. So it's a bit mixed on these slides, but basically on the bottom left and right, uh, I worked with an ASL performer and uh, with uh, some of my voice students, we sang a song in sign language. Um, they are 13 years old. Uh, I also gave a, a Braille music score reading tutorial to explore other ways of reading music. And uh, I also uh, uh, worked with new technology instruments uh, or, you know, so, so really I try to apply uh, things that like exploring different kind of instruments that can be played without touch or with the use of new technology, things like that. So what I try to apply is what I learned from the musicians I interviewed who told me that they wish they could have uh, that uh, done that in class. And I got some funding from my university for uh, the launch of these workshops. And now we work with the school and with the teachers and with my different partners uh, to continue these workshops. It's, it's really a team effort, right? So that's my theory to practice story. Now let's talk about um, the next step after education, which is actually performing. So with CDS, with the critical lens, uh, the social model, crib culture, everything that we have seen uh, together since the beginning, um, there are now new options for uh, musicians with disabilities to think about their own identity as a performer. And this is why this section is called performance and activism, because we spend a lot of time adv advocating for more accessibility in the music industry. And a good example of someone who is very involved in disability rights activism is the singer Lachi. And not only with activism, but with disability awareness, uh, which is key to the visibility of disabled artists within the music industry. 
But uh, the inclusion of disability, whether as uh, an audience member or as an artist, has been very slow. And discussions and initiatives have been present for uh, quite a long time, right? Uh, we've seen that at the beginning of the, uh, the at, at the beginning of this presentation, I talked about UPIAS, and this was 1972. And the disability rights movements in Tripcamp, it's the 1970s too. So since then, there are lots of conversations that happen, but it's still slow. And today, in order to be heard or seen, uh, disabled musicians, uh, sorry, yes, I'm going to talk about that. Um, disabled musicians use music as a tool for disability activism, uh, inviting other disabled artists to join them, to show disability pride, and to fight for disabled musicians to get a place on stage. So here we go, Lachi. Uh, she's an American singer um, and she plays the piano too. She's a Latina singer. She's a songwriter uh, and she has a, a visual impairment. Uh, she's known for including thoughts about disability in the music industry, particularly in the Recording Academy and the, you know, the Grammy Awards. Um, and when she goes out, she uh, gets noticed. I, I really loved work, work, working with her. Uh, she loves fashion. And that's another preconceived idea that she wants to break about blind people and fashion. Like you cannot see, so you cannot use fashion. So she's a huge uh, activist uh, against these these preconceived ideas, and she always wears dresses that uh, attract the eyes for those who can see. And even her cane, right? So it's it's uh, everything. It's like she's she's glowing, and she has a strong voice too for those who can hear this voice. Um, her way of being an activist is to be where uh, the music industry is and to raise awareness. So I interviewed her several times and we talked about the fact that uh, when she was growing up, she didn't have any role model as a young musician. Uh, since nobody was like her on TV or on the radio, so there is a, a lack of role model that comes with also the lack of public representation of artists with disabilities. And also when you start as a young artist, uh, whether you're disabled or not, uh, you, when you're signed, signed for the first time, you don't have anyone to guide you. And it is a learning curve and it is even worse for artists with disabilities. So in one of these interviews, she told me about her past experience when she got signed for the first time. And so I wanted to share an excerpt of that with you. And the interview was on the phone. I know that when I first got signed, I had a band that I played with and everyone in the band was visually impaired or blind. And I know that when we would go to concert venues to do our shows, um, there just was no accommodation whatsoever. Uh, they would be, you know, it's interesting to kind of note, like a lot of stages don't really have the safest way to get on a stage whether there's uh, no ramp, obviously for people with wheelchairs, but some of them don't even have stairs. So people kind of have to, you know, take a big uh, step up to get onto the stage and they just assume, oh, well, whatever, just get up, you know, you're fine. Uh, but for someone who's blind, uh, that's a very, uh, <laughs> that's almost like a task that is life or death in a sense. So a lot of stages were difficult to access. Lighting is always an issue when it comes to, um, so we did a lot of dance and even today I do a lot of dance and pop and things like that. So we do nightclubs, which are often dark. And uh, so being able to see is rough. I personally have night blindness. So mm -hmm. being able to see in a dark club is very tough. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's also difficult to find whoever you're supposed to be dealing with. So a lot of the times I will travel with obviously some sort of road person or, or my agent or whatnot in order to make sure everything is fine. So Lexi's actions demonstrate that the battle for being recognized as a professional musician, not as a disabled professional musician, notes, um, it can be part of a wider conversation within the music industry. Uh, and by talking about these issues, we might see changes in the accessibility of these workplaces, like we see in other domains. Uh, we might include the needs the performers have in terms of adaptations, uh, for example, through the use of new technology or connectivity with adapted instruments, um, but also mobility and access, 
for example, these uh, adapted lightings, uh, realms to access the stage, accessible washrooms, things like that, as part as, uh, of a regular contract for a concert. And in order to get uh, some representations of disability on stage, it often comes from uh, to the efforts of disabled communities uh, to do something about disability representation by creating special events fully open to all kinds of disabilities or by claiming the desire to become a role model uh, as a recognized disabled artist. So Lachi contacted uh, the Recording Ad Academy and proposed to co-host uh, panels about accessibility. And I attended one of them in April 2021, organized by the New York chapter of the Grammy entitled uh, New York chapter, Music, Purpose, and Community. And she invited several disabled musicians to discuss and to propose improvements for the, the inclusion of disabled artists in the music industry, uh, starting with the observation that disability is not uh, thought as a diversity, particularly in big musical organizations. And the artists uh, pointed out that the word itself, disability, seemed to be taboo in the music industry, and uh, there are not enough successful disabled musicians to act as role model for young musicians who wish to become uh, professional. So I wanted to show you here, uh, it's almost over. <laughs> uh, I wanted to show you a short clip of this panel with Lachi talking about the importance of uh, disability representation. And actually, I wish I could talk about all these musicians. There is Galen Lee on uh, Lachi's right. Uh, she's an she's really involved in disability activism, disability rights activism too, and she's an awesome violinist and singer. Actually, they all share uh, what Lachi talks about in this video, so let's hear that. I actually like the word disability. I know that people are afraid or or don't really like the word dis d i s the prefix dis, but I am distinguished. I'm distinct. Those start with d i s, and I have a disability. And I don't do things despite my disability. I do things because of my disability. And I encourage anyone with a disability watching this that it's who you are. We need to start looking at things in the social model, like Galen said, as opposed to the medical model, which means um, that it's not about an impairment. If you're able to, if I'm able to access a staircase, if I, if you, if I have a wheelchair and you give me a staircase, I can't get up the staircase, but if you give me an elevator, I can. And all of a sudden, I'm no longer, quote unquote, disabled because I'm able to get to the second floor. So it was a very successful panel. It was well attended and with very interesting uh, conversations. But after that, the Recording Ac Academy uh, told Lachi that they would come back to them. But there was no them. The participants invited were individual musicians. So Lachi and Galen Lee realized that what was needed was an organization. Thus, they created together a coalition of music professionals called RUMPTS, Recording Artists and Music Professionals with Disabilities. And the organization was launched in January 2022, so a few months after that, uh, almost one year. Their aim is to uh, amplify disability culture promote inclusion and advocates uh, for accessibility within the music industry. And for the two performers, uh, creating a, a cohort of uh, music professionals with all kinds of disabilities gives a, a strong, uh, stronger public representation and a presence to all disabled musicians. And I'm also a proud pro member of this cohort as a singer and as a musicologist. Thank you. <laughs> And for me, the organization is also a good example of theory to practice. Uh, there is a famous motto in, in disability activism that says, nothing about us without us. And we include ourselves as disabled artists in the conversation uh, about disability in music. And we use initiatives like RAMP as a new tool for disability activism in music. And that's the end of my presentation. But I also wanted to take the time to answer some of your questions that you might have. Uh, and I know you absorbed a lot of information in a short time. So I hope that you learned something interesting and I will have the time to take two or three questions. Uh, there are also lots of references. If you want to, me to send that to you, just, just send me an email. And um, if you want to go further in the topic, don't hesitate to contact me. And this is my contact information. 
And I'm going to sh stop sharing so that I can see everybody. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and I will put um, Ms. Colin's email address and website also in the chat link if people want to take a look at it. Um, we uh, It's 10 till. Thank you for leaving time for questions. I believe we can spill over a little beyond two o'clock for those who want and can stay. Uh, but I will. Um, I can help moderate uh, gladly. Um, there were lots of interesting comments in the chat. I put a couple of additional links to for folks who want to follow up as well. Uh, but I don't see any questions in the chat, and so we can just open it up for anybody who would like to ask any questions of Ms. Colin. And don't be shy. <laughs> yes. Ms. Heroes. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you so much for this presentation. This was really wonderful and just a, a huge wealth of information. So I appreciate that. Um, so I was curious, you talked a lot about um, uh, like deaf musicians and that, that whole presentation with Evelyn Glennie and how she perceives their vibrations. Um, I, I was wondering, you as a singer, have you experimented at all with how those vibrations maybe or sensing those vibrations maybe influence your singing and how you learn singing? And then if so, um, I'm wondering if you've implemented that at all into those classes that you teach with students and how that went. Yes. Definitely, I tried a lot of different things. So first of all, I tried some vibrating devices, including one that you can put around your waist or here, depending. Um, and this actually transforms the sound into vibration. And so I, I made this is this is, this is something that you cannot use for someone who has a pacemaker, for example, because it's really vibrating. <laughs> and uh, we we uh, we just felt the music. And then we tried to put our hands into on, on vibrating instruments such as the piano. So we went uh, around the piano and we sang and someone was playing the piano and we could feel the vibration of the music that was accompanying us. And suddenly you start realizing that your own body is vibrating and everything that is happening. I'm sitting in a wheelchair, right? And um, I could feel the floor vibrating. And I could feel something tingling in my hands, and like, and so with the children, that that's that's very interesting to do. But also with adults, really, it's something to explore a different feeling when you are singing or performing. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I was curious if, if nobody has questions, I have a question for you. Did you ever go to a concert uh, or attend uh, a piece that was written by or uh, worked with artists with disabilities? May I? Yes, yeah, of course. Right. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I'm a composer. Um, I'm disabled in the sense that I have uh, clinical depression and issues with anxiety. And, and so I have mental disabilities, but I, I worked with uh, a physically disabled saxophonist named Dr. David Nabb, who teaches at the University of Nebraska at Kearney. Uh, he is a one-handed saxophone player. Um, he commissioned the, uh, he, he was a stroke survivor. I mean, he has both his arms, but, but one of them is not, not functioning. Um, and uh I wrote a concerto for him um, to uh, be premiered on a, a one-handed, specially adapted saxophone that he commissioned a friend of his to build for him. I don't remember the name of the friend, um, but that was really marvelous. And he he told me, you know, write me a real concerto. Don't write me anything watered down or anything that would be, you know, write me something real, write a real piece and I will play it. And he did. And it was one of the highlights of my professional career, I, I must say. Um, there's a YouTube video of him playing a, a piano sonata of mine as well. Um, uh, alas, the concerto was not captured for um, YouTube consumption, but but we've worked together um, consistently over the past uh, five or six years now. And um, he's, a, he's a tremendous musician. I mean, that's that, that's the thing that is really remarkable is that he trained himself to use this toggle key function that basically doubles the instrument so that he can play the entire thing with his left hand and he's just a remarkably gifted musician and and it, you know it's you know 
I think it's important that we establish the viability of his horn as an equal and viable uh, performing alternative for, for other similarly impaired musicians. So yeah, that was one of the highlights of my compositional career has been working with David. Excellent, I, thank I, you for sharing a, a, that. A, a, a quick note here, I've, I've put a couple of links in the chat um, of, of Professor Gross's composition and above it, uh, David Nabb's personal page, if anybody's interested in following up. Thank you. That's awesome. I, I didn't have the time to talk about adaptive instruments, but that's a huge thing, right? It's it, it, in especially, that's why education, it's really important. When the teachers decide to go a little bit beyond what they are supposed to teach, like the traditional way of teaching, and say, let's find a solution. And I've worked with a, a team in Australia and um, in Melbourne. They have this university. They paired with uh, an organologist uh, who's building instruments. And she is herself in a wheelchair that is inclined like that. So she's building, she's having, managing a team of people building adaptive instruments and this or adapted or transformed instruments. Sometimes just transforming it is enough for someone who is uh, missing some mobility to play, but you have to work with individually each person and try to find a way to make it happen. And when it happens, it's fantastic. Yes. We have a question in the chat. Yeah, Madame Kuchuket. Oh, oh yeah. Hi, thanks so much. It's so inspiring. I really uh, enjoyed your, your talk. Um, I was studying long, long ago, about 20 years ago, with a blind classical singer. And I remember how hard it was for her to get some braille, braille uh, parts. Yes. And I was curious if it evolved since all those years. Yes, it did. Especially awesome. two days ago, the Library, Library of Congress has announced that they received hundreds of scores in braille from a music school that was uh, that was getting rid of old archives because they numerized everything and they ha they they have this huge collection they already have a good good collection so usually when you need a braille what what I did because I'm in Toronto and we have CNIB uh, the, the Canadian Institute for the Blind and I went to them and I said I want to do a braille workshop first of all one how do I learn and two how do I get some braille music and they have a small catalog, but they would they told me, go to the Library of Congress and try to see, they have lots of music, try to see which ones are already printed. And because to print some braille music, that's the complicated parts, right? I can show you one of my braille scores here. And if I you get very close, you can yes. see, and it, it's totally different from Braille, uh, the alphabet. It's, it's, it takes its origin from that. But then there is uh, the, the height of the notes is indicated at the very beginning of each line. And then each uh, line here, it, this represents a note, a note, a note, a note, a note, a note. So you have to understand the rhythm and the note. And it's, so it's very complicated. And in the same way, it's very easy. Wow. And then... So, so Institute of the Blinds are one of the the sources, and then uh, the, the the Congress, the Library of Congress. Wow, that's amazing! Thanks. And I wanted to add, like, I'm not disabled. I, I'm just really tiny as a person, and I'm a flutist. And I studied in modern flute, and I had to put extensions on my keys for my hands to feel comfortable after a while. And a lot of people were like, well, you need to stretch or whatever. And I was dreaming to play Baroque flute, but it was too big for me. Oh. So I, but one day I just bought one because I thought I just wanted to try, even though it was big. And then I figured out that if I was on placing the 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 holes because they're not they're in four parts contrary to the modern flute so i was able to turn it around and now i'm doing my masters in baroque flute because i was able and so i thought the, ah, the so speech cool. of wow. disability it being something i always thought because i'm i'm four ten so i'm really tiny and huh? my whole life i've been like laughed at or but i always thought it was a superpower and i think something 
when someone is special, it's something that we need to use as something so powerful and different and wonderful. So it was so inspiring to hear your 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 whole talk. Really, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. That's awesome. Did you know the 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 flutes that can be played like that, like instead of that, like that? Yeah, the, the only thing with those, it's because the head joint in the modern flute is really what produces the sound and it's conic. So when you you make some, uh, you break that cone, then the, the power and it's it's harder to have a really good one. But yeah, for I always uh, ask my students that are small to buy a curved head joint or that type of head joint to help them at least play. Yeah. Wow. That is a wonderful observation. That, that this idea of the standardized body and the standardized technique in music teaching goes well beyond disability. So thank you so much for bringing up that point. I'm, I'm going to drop uh, another thing here in the chat, which is um, uh, it, it's a video, it's a 20 minute video presentation by Ms. Colin on her work with adaptive instruments. That's part of a, a panel we had a, um, last month at a conference um, on music disability. So if you want to watch it later, it's a 20 minute video that you can watch later. Thank you. Other questions, thoughts, comments? Again, we're just past two. People can stay or leave as, as they wish. Ms. Colin said that she can stick around a little bit longer. So thoughts, questions in addition. Well, you don't hesitate if you have some that like this night you just wake up and say, <gasps> I forgot to ask that. <laughs> Don't hesitate to send me an email. <laughs> and I can put my email by the way. Yeah, actually, if, if, right, if, if, if you do that, I was about, I just realized I hadn't done it yet, but if you can do that, voila. Thank you very much, all. Um, again, really um, such wonderful topics, such extraordinary work. Uh, and I look forward to continuing to hear about your work. Again, um, I, I'll drop actually, um, uh, it's uh, your website, right, is Diane colin.com right i think at this yeah. point uh, a lot of good stuff there not only about disability uh, Ms. colin works actually on 19th century music more broadly in, and has done some extraordinary work in plus jazz she's a phenomenal jazz singer i still, I still haven't heard you sing jazz i'll have to sooner or later but yeah but but th th <laughs> it is it, it is reputed that you are a fabulous jazz singer i mean it's established internationally so thank you all <laughs> for joining us uh and, and again uh any other questions you have for Ms. colin feel free to contact her and thank you for bringing us these examples afterwards because actually for example uh professor gross's um composition Ms. Roquette's example is shows how important this is more broadly so thank you for joining us and have a lovely rest of the afternoon <laughs>